You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. I feel like who art ed? Try to spice it. Who art ed? Mr. Wood <laughs> art ed me. Yeah. Either way, it, 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 it works on so many levels. I know. I thought it a great start. Welcome to Who Arted, where we explore visual arts in an audio medium. I'm your host, Kyle Wood, and back again, I have Chuck Hoff. Thanks for joining me for part two on Vincent Van Gogh. Oh, I was just happy to make the cut, so I'm now on part <laughs> two, so I must have done something well in part one. Um, what is it? Most of success is just showing up, so <laughs> <laughs> I, I appreciate you're always willing to show up for me, man. Um, and... For those who didn't show up to last week's episode, you can always go back and download it. But uh, the brief recap, we talked about the early part of Vincent van Gogh's life where it seems like he was dabbling in different careers. He was an art dealer. He was studying theology. He was working for some portion of his time as a missionary and creating really traditional, in some ways, you know, Dutch Debbie Downer paintings that are like super dark um, in that way that like Rembrandt would have been, you know, always very dark pigments with that dramatic lighting. And we talked about the potato eaters. Now we're going to shift focus a little bit to, I'd say, the more mature phase of Van Gogh's career. In 1886, he moved to Paris, and when he moved to Paris, I I noticed there was a dramatic shift in his approach, specifically the color scheme, and historically, this is around the time when synthetic pigments were starting to be mass-produced and more readily available, and Vincent van Gogh seemed to really just thrive on taking in all of those colors and what we think of as the impressionistic palette. And he adopted a lot of that. Uh, When he moved to Paris, he was living with his brother, Theo, and he started to surround himself. He's with other artists. He's meeting people like Emile Bernard, Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec, a whole bunch of other names that I cannot pronounce, so I'm not even going to try. But, you know, during that time, he's studying more art. He's learning from other artists. He's looking at sort of the he's looking at the color theory, the optical color mixing and stuff like that. Look, uh, he seemed to be really taken, especially with theories about the juxtaposition of complementary colors or putting complementary colors side by side and the vibrant effects that you can get from that. And it seems like Vincent Van Gogh was probably kind of terrible to live with really interesting artist and in some ways such a sympathetic character he is in my mind the sort of archetypal tortured artist and while a lot of us sort of romanticize that idea the reality was probably a lot different and a lot harder to deal with um Theo is said to have found living with Vincent to be kind of unbearable. And so in 1887, Vincent moved to a suburb of Paris. And like I said, he continues to develop his work and Theo continues to support him. But Vincent's sort of bouncing around and meeting other artists and, you know, not staying too long with anyone. Yeah, I I think making friends, keeping friends became really difficult and the company he kept um again they later became uh famous artists in their own right so i'm i'm sure there was a you know like a strand of commonality where they would just talk but then i could imagine if he had an episode where he was really dark and depressed people would kind of push him away He was struggling with a lot, not only trying to find his place in the world and um, develop as an artist, but also he did suffer from a mental illness of some sort and possibly different illnesses that were comorbid. Um, Diagnoses from that time included epilepsy, but historians have looked back and said it's possible he suffered from a bipolar disorder. He seemed to have extreme depressive states and manic episodes. Um, And all of this was made worse because of the fact that he wasn't eating. He, he, 
as we talked about last week, remember we, we said like he just dove into whatever he was doing. He spent all his money on paints instead of food. Like he ate just enough to stay alive. And on top of that, he was drinking too much. So when you have that combination of poor nutrition, an underlying mental mental illness, and um, a substance abuse disorder, I mean, that's a toxic combo. The thing that I, I it struck me is is this. I mean, if you had to sum up kind of where he was at, I mean, think about how this was written. And it was said, you know, one of the things. Uh, he did was he looked at the color theory, right? Yeah. And he looked at complementary colors and he looked at the vibrant effects. Okay. However, like his perspective on this uh, was that he tried to express the terrible passions of humanity by means of red and green. I mean, just that slant on life would alone make me, I don't know, push him away a little bit. I can see where Theo would be happy. Well, finally, you're using the yellows and the reds um, and the greens. And he's like, yeah, but here's what I'm trying to get at. Maybe Theo rolls his eyes and just says, typical Vincent, can't look at the positive, you know? <laughs> yeah, and you're talking about the um, the picture. It's, it's one of his famous works, um, the interior of, like, we see the billiard table and everything like that. Um, and... Vincent had this really sort of poetic way of describing his work, you know, tried to express the terrible passions of humanity by red, by means of red and green. I mean, yeah, it's kind of a dark downer thing, but he's also he's also expressing himself and describing his work in a way that feels somewhat poetic at times. It kind of reminds me of, of Monk as he talked about the scream and everything like that. And one of the things about Van Gogh was he was, for all his struggles, he was a very, very erudite, very learned person. Uh, he spoke three languages. He spoke French, Dutch, and English. Um, he was an avid reader. He was reading about astronomy, which I believe, my personal belief is, that came up later in the Starry Night painting, which we'll discuss later. Um, but he was reading a lot, studying a lot. He was looking at, as you said, he, you know, his circle of friends was these other artists that became really big names in art history. And at that time, they were they were successful, but not of the stature that we think of them now. Like, you know, um, Toulouse Lautrec would just be going to a, a, a cafe like anybody else, like he was an approachable figure. And Van Gogh was kind of the less successful artist in that collective. And I think, like you say, it was probably to some extent people, people would roll their eyes a little bit maybe, but also just, I think it's exhausting being around somebody who is going to that degree all the time. You know what I'm saying? Like I have I have been around people who are very intense and very driven. Um and it's inspiring at times and especially from a distance. But when you're living with them and like they're going all night and you're just like, "Dude, I want to go to sleep." Can we stop talking about painting for a minute, you know? Um, oh, uh, for sure. Like I, in college, I was a uh, cross country runner and our program was, was, was good. And so what we had was we had 80 guys and of the 80 guys, you'd always have a handful that just could never let it go. And so we'd be in the cafeteria or other places and they would just, you know, talk and talk and talk about running. And I'm just thinking, well, we just did the running part. Like that part is over. It is time to move on. And I wonder if if Vincent would get into these heavier conversations. I do wonder if, you know, people look at this pool table and this beautiful red room with the light and they think maybe he's turning a corner. Like this is outstanding. And the yellows for inside a room, it's not very dark. And then he just goes into a deep dive 
about how depressing everything is in this picture. And if you start looking at the characters, most of them, you know, slumped I, I have, over. And, yeah, yeah. They're sleeping on the tables. This guy is, a, you know, basically alone at the pool table. You get it, but, but you don't have to go there. And and I just wonder if that was the conflict where he would take people to that place and they were just completely happy staying in a different place. Like, I, no, no, I was looking at this, Vincent, as one of the happier pieces you've ever made. So don't go there again. And, he's like, <laughs> and then he gets pretty frustrated because, you know, he's like, I'm expressing, you know, how terrible this is, how terrible humanity is. And they're like, enough. <laughs> Yeah, but like, and I think that's kind of, that's kind of the reason that I would say probably in his lifetime, he was not commercially successful. But looking back through the lens of history, we can see the brilliance and appreciate the brilliance of it. Because I look at that, and again, it's the inherent contradictions, and it's the way that like, from a distance, you have like these bright colors, but then up close, you see the figures are slumped over and it's like, oh, there's this other layer. There's this other nuance. It's it's that complementary, that opposites being put together in some ways. And when you read about that in a text and you're looking at, at that as a painting on the wall, it's like, wow, that's a brilliant artist. But when you're when you're on the ground living with someone... That had to be an exhausting to be around. Yeah, no, no doubt. And I think too, when I, when I think of, um, you know, tragic stories in, in a way. Yeah. I think the most contemporary one that we all live through, and and that is like the Robin Williams effect, right? So if you go and look at his body of work, and we won't do a deep dive or anything. I'm just saying, yeah, he passed too early. But if you look at his work. It's brilliant. And it's even more brilliant after he passes. You know, when you go back and you start to look at his soul, you know, in the characters that he was playing, you know, like a Patch Adams or a, yeah. it, it just, you feel even more for the character. And so I, I think there might have been some of this with Vincent. You know, when he passes, then these paintings become, I, don't, I wouldn't, and I wouldn't say glorified, but I would say, more intense because you begin to realize that he was suffering um, through I, his paintings. I think that's true. And I, I, I also think that you appreciate it differently when the artist's story feels more complete and, you know, like you see the full trajectory of his life and his creation after he's passed and and that's where it becomes this narrative that we can understand and that's why i always start with the story behind the work because that context helps us to view it differently and so i guess getting back to his story like we're we're in like the last 2 years of his life now like 1888 he moves to arles his hope was kind of a fresh start after the struggles in paris and the falling out with theo although they did patch their relationship and theo continued to support him financially and everything like that um as well as emotionally i mean they wrote together regularly but his hope was to start an artist colony in Arles. He had this idea that it was going to be this beautiful colony and he rented the yellow house and he was going to be out in nature and other artists would come and they would talk about painting and learn from each other and all of that. And it seems like it seems like he was really excited about about this and like I read that he kind of went a little bit over budget, spending money that maybe he didn't have or couldn't afford to on furniture in anticipation of Paul Gauguin coming. And Paul Gauguin was an artist that was a little bit more successful than Vincent van Gogh was at this point. And Theo basically kind of bribed Gauguin to go down and live with his brother for a little while. It seems like Theo advanced him money for the sales of paintings that hadn't even been created yet um, in order to convince Gauguin to go down there. And from what I understand, they got along okay for a little while, 
but it was a volatile relationship between Van Gogh and Gauguin. Um, they did talk about and learn from each other. Van Gogh was insistent on painting and drawing from observation of nature, and Gauguin was encouraging him to be a little bit more creative and do more from memory and imagination. They did benefit from some of this collaboration, but they also got into really intense arguments um, because they did clash at times. And because Vincent van Gogh could be exhausting to be around and because Paul Gauguin was a monster, and I'm not going to go too much into his biography, but he seems like he was an awful, awful dude. And after one intense fight, I think this was, uh, it was late December, it was like December 23rd, 1888. It sounds like there are not, there's not like a clear historical consensus on what exactly happened. But basically, Paul Gauguin said, I'm out. I am done with all of this. And Vincent van Gogh kind of felt like he had ruined and lost his opportunity at his dream of an artist colony. The general consensus is Vincent van Gogh suffered a a mental breakdown at that point. And if you you know one thing that Vincent van Gogh did that was kind of out there, what would it be? Well, you know, cutting the ear. Cutting the ear. Um, And... Some people say he cut off his his whole ear as a way of silencing the voices because he was known to have suffered from hallucinations at some points. Um, I've also read that some people say this was an act of self-injury and a way of trying to atone or something as a way like he was blaming himself. And I think there was a character in a book that did something similar to this around that time. And so that could have been an inspiration for it. The explanation that I tend to favor is that Paul Gauguin actually cut off Van Gogh's ear because Paul Gauguin was known to carry a sword for self-defense. And it just seems like the kind of thing he would have done. Um, because, And they say it was actually a clean cut, which some historians say – you wouldn't do that to yourself. That's more likely from somebody doing it to him. But Vincent van Gogh is said to have not remembered that incident. They found him um, self-bandaged, and he was lucky to have survived because um, there was a significant a significant injury and a significant loss of blood there. That excitement in renting and furnishing four rooms of a house to make that colony, I think – that can't be understated as to why he may have flipped because it was Theo's money and he burned through it and it didn't work out. Um, how this would have worked out differently if, if he had chose just a different artist, you know, yes, it probably would have soured at some point, but you're right. He picked the absolute worst artist to um, share this house with. Uh, and so that that's what led to this um you know, to this point where we're at now in the discussion. But that led to him going into the asylum at saint Rami, 19th century asylums for people suffering from mental illnesses do not have a great track record and a, a great history. There's a lot of really dark stuff there. But Vincent van Gogh seems to have been very fortunate in the the care that he received because the asylum at San Rami was a progressive institution where they had gardens. They believed that getting people out with nature would help to restore them. And this was probably the healthiest period of his, of his adult life where he was taken away from the, the vices like drinking and he was, in a more calm place where he could paint. They gave him two rooms so that he could like use one as a studio and continue his painting because the doctors felt like that was therapeutic for him. But also he was getting three meals a day. Um, he was just meeting his needs physiologically and 
slowing down and getting the calm and the peace and the rest that he needed, you know, psychologically as well. And so this is where he he developed a number of paintings and included in that body of work is probably his best known painting, The Starry Night. In 88, you know, Vincent made Starry Night over the Rhone and strikingly similar in some ways, um, but it probably led to, you know, finishing or at least inspiring Starry, Starry Night. Or is it just called Starry Night? Uh, it's generally referred to as the Starry Night. I mean, the Starry Night, yeah. I don't think he was writing the title in English when he was talking about it. But um, yeah, the Starry Night over the Rhone, that was an interesting painting. That was another one that had, if I recall correctly, it again had that heavy imp- impasto, the brush strokes, um, the really thick paints, and it had sort of an angular composition to it. And I, I, I think in a lot of this work, whether it's the paintings that he was doing from his view from his bedroom window during the daytime, because he made many of these landscapes during that period, um, or the famous Starry Night painting that we're talking about today, a lot of it shows this little bit of kind of the the Japanese woodcut influence because of like the way that it's like this cl- close cropped composition, which probably also in some way is due to like the influence of photography and the way that photogra- like a snapshot is cropped and we see things running off the edges and things are not like neatly uh, like at a horizontal. We see like that angular the slope of the horizon line and stuff like that in a lot of his work, which feels to me like a lot of like Hokusai's works as well. You know what I mean? And the other thing I, I've noticed stylistically around this period, we see a, a quite a bit of like a black outline and f- flat almost fields of color filling in those shapes, you know? Yes. Um, which Again, I, I attribute a lot to the influence of the the Japanese woodcuts, which were very popular in Europe at that time. And Vincent van Gogh was a big fan of that stuff. Like I said, he consumed a lot of culture and studied a lot and looked at he, – he read, he looked at other works of art from other artists he knew and from other parts of the world. Yeah, and it, and it – you know, what struck me a little bit about Starry Night on the Rhone – and then uh, other pieces that he's done um, is how similar it looked like you know, to Edward Monk's The Scream. And that comes out, you know, five years later. Um, in fact, um, paintings were, were put together, um, uh, similar paintings by Monk and, and Vincent, just to show that comparison. Because he did a painting um, off a bridge um, I forget what it was called, but <clears throat> I just I just find that to, the parallel here to be um, striking in that, you know, the scream, then we use that as a way to uh, talk about depression or anxiety. It, and, and they were st- strikingly different than um, some of the paintings of that time. Yeah. And I think from a historical perspective, I think Vincent van Gogh is that artist who, at least in hindsight, in the the great arc, arc of history and the narrative that we tell, I look at his work and the work of that time period as a major shift from when art stopped being about just close observation of nature and started to become more about the expressive qualities a lot of his stuff is sort of psychological portraits in some ways. Um, I remember one of my one of my friends, uh, uh, another painter. We were roommates for a while in in college, and and he loved Vincent Van Gogh like I did, and he he. But I remember his frustration looking at Van Gogh's work and just like the jealousy because he would be like, man, he could make anything expressive he could he could paint bushes and make them expressive and like that's a hard thing to do 
it's it's a thing that has been imitated today. You know, I go into some of the small towns in Colorado and the local artists are doing that with the animals and the landscapes. And it's just a knockoff. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. From 150 years ago, it's 100 percent Van Gogh. And I and, you know, getting to that parallel, you know, one more time that it, it was written and I'm reading this here. Um, it was it, it says Monk was the friend Van Gogh never found. Monk was the friend Van Gogh never found. Would he have been a better companion than Gauguin? And and it was just it, it's just funny that way because they're super expressive people through their paintings. Yeah. Um, and I just I I like that just connection uh, real quick. And I know we want to probably do a deep dive into Starry Night. Yeah, I, I I think you're right. I think the two of them pr- had a lot of similarities in in their approach to painting, and it is interesting to think about like how how they would have influenced and worked off each other, or maybe would have fed each other's worst impulses <laughs> <laughs> and encouraged each other to both go farther off the deep end. But yeah, bringing it back to the Starry Night because that is one of one of the most famous paintings of all time. You know, what do you see there? What are you thinking? Well, it, you know, obviously the swirl uh, dominates. Um, and a young observer will never quite understand the, the bush or the cypress. What was it? The cypress tree or the. Yeah. Um, he'll, they'll never understand that unless they have them in the neighborhood. They'll see it as a flame, you know, um, at least my early interpreters do. Um, and so there's there's a little bit of looking into this um obviously we got we got stunning foreground with that tree we have fabulous middle ground um and the background gets dwarfed pretty quickly with uh the dominance of the stars um love love the love the piece obviously uh and so did don mclean that's why i called it the starry starry night Um, (laughs) But, um, but yeah, and, and a fabulous use of cool colors with just a touch of the comp, you know, the complementary color or that little bit of warmth to give it the contrast it needs, um, and sending those stars closer to you. Yeah. I mean, there's so much blue, it almost feels monochromatic. And then those pops of yellow in, in the moon and the stars and, um, you know, just to the right of the cypress tree, like right about the middle, there's one that looks kind of, it has a white halo around it, seems a little bit brighter. I think Vincent van Gogh referred to that as the morning star, although historians have said like that probably would have been Venus in the sky at that point. Um, but yeah, it it is almost like a complementary color scheme. Because depending on the color model that you're working from and stuff like that, you know, blue and yellow are are arguably opposites. Um, And it's kind of this orangey yellow. And we see we see those pops not only in the sky, but then also like in the buildings, in the windows, making those look lit up as almost this like mirror to the action that's happening, lighting up the sky, which I find kind of interesting as a compositional strategy. Uh, no doubt. And um, this seems to be the most one of the most common paintings that young art teachers have their students reproduce through oil paints and such. I know I did. And oh, all the time. Yeah. Right, right, right. And um, one of the things that strikes me um, and I'm, I'm just looking at a, a quick print and to the left of this story, story night, you actually do see the canvas, uh, which is hilarious. I, I'm, I'm just looking at one of the images here. Um, but it, it's sized as just over two feet by three feet. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those that strikes me as the, um, a piece that should be quite a bit larger. Um, and so I, I would see it as, is coming into a room and it's on the back wall of that room because of all the action and all of the paint strokes captured. And yet we're, we're looking at, um, you know, a small card table, if not a little bit smaller, you know, the folding card table. And so that, that would stun me. If I walked into the room, I, 
I'm not sure if you saw this live, right? Did you see this in person? Yeah, I, I, I've seen this in person. And I, I, I got to say, like, I, I was in awe of it seeing it in person um, just because, you know, it's one of my favorite works of all time for for any number of reasons. But, um, you know, seeing the brush strokes and seeing like the thickness of the paint and the richness of that is wonderful in person. But you're right. It's not a massive work. And in some ways, I think it's probably for most people more inspiring going to the immersive Van Gogh experiences where they've got the projections that are just filling the space and surrounding you and bringing you into that world. And he was not painting on that scale. Um, and I think I think it would be cool if, if it were painted on that scale. I would love to see his works like mural sized, but but this is kind of about the, the scale that he tended to work in. Most of his works are kind of smaller to mid-sized. Well, what was it, 2,100 works? Yeah, you don't have, you don't have enough time to go that big. <laughs> Plus, like, as a practical matter, there's the expense. Like, his stuff was not exactly selling out during his lifetime. Yeah, I could see some loans, you know. Uh, Theo, I need a little bit more money for paint, you know, yeah. and, and, and that being a constant. And so, you know, sometimes we ask the why or we analyze and you think about those things and you think maybe that's just the, what the artist could afford yeah. or or just could get as a resource, you know, at the local art store. Like, I don't know, we sometimes overanalyze it. And I think maybe sometimes this is all he could afford. And he was so successful with it. Do you know yeah. if this sold during his life or no? No, I don't think it did. I mean, this this was painted in the asylum. And the the works that he was creating in the asylum and in, in that hospital stay, I mean, towards the end of his life, like the, the people around him did not think of him as like this amazing artist. They thought of him as a madman. Like I, there's a story about the painting that he made of um, one of his doctor, like Dr. Felix Ray, he painted this portrait and gave it to him. And the doctor's just like, oh, thanks. But he, apparently he like hated the portrait and like used it to patch a chicken coop or something <laughs> like that. Um, and, and then like later just gave it away. Today, it's probably worth like, you know, million, tens of millions of dollars. But during that time, it was just like, this is this is something my patient did, you know, to keep himself calm. I mean, this is the view out of his window, but what he leaves out of the painting was that view had bars in the window. Mm -hmm. The view was a little bit different from what he painted. He moved the cypress tree way up close in the foreground to make it ginormous. The actual village would have had like hundreds of houses. He painted about a dozen or so. You know, he was making these leaps. I think the the sky, it's safe to assume, was not, you know, moving in the way that he painted it. It wasn't like this wave crashing down. But um, he was doing some elements from observation. And I think it was kind of almost a collage approach where we see some things like the moon is up there, but also we see Venus in the sky and um, a constellation. I think it was Aries is a constellation. And all three of those would not have been visible simultaneously, but they would have been visible at different points in the day and night and early morning hours. And so he's kind of putting together those different observations, synthesizing them into one. No, oh, yeah, yeah, obstructed. Um, so here's an obstructed view. Yeah. Um, elevated, probably multi-night, like you said, to capture stars, the moon, and, you know, some wind. So just uh, fabulous with the restraints he was under. And again, you yeah. probably have to memorize some of the, th you know, some of this because, it's pitch black. You know, I, I don't know if he's doing this by candle or he just waits till the next morning, right. To, to begin the process. Well, so from what I understand, it was kind of like 
he looked out the window of one room and then he kind of painted in the morning looking out the window from an, another room and kind of combined some elements of those views. And he made multiple sketches in preparation for this. And those swirls in the middle, um, in some ways, they look very similar to sketches that were in an astronomy book that that came out around that time. Although I got to say, every time I look at this, I think of like Hokusai's Great Way if that looks like a tsunami coursing across that sky i look at it in some ways it feels turbulent and, and in other ways it feels like there's this stillness to it and I, like so many pieces of van gogh's work what i find really interesting is that contradiction between the sort of placid and peaceful village and then that just incredible movement and and the the undulating sky that we see above it well and it's such a good point that you know you have this nature versus man right in your textbooks right and you think he probably captured it it's a peaceful town with almost every light on except for the church ironically where the doors are always open and so here we are in the but above them something is happening, something's brewing. And um, I could think of back a year and a half ago where we had the derecho and my wife and I were just walking up the block and above us, there was the front line clouds, you know, and they were almost still. And they were the darkest line of clouds from one part of the sky to the other. And I could just think like in about 30 seconds, it's going to do unbelievable damage and then it'll be gone. And, and so I don't know if it's that agitation Mm -hmm. that he was able to like make you just obsess about it, but everyone's like, they're either having dinner or they're just peacefully having a conversation because we know it's Mm -hmm. 1800s, late 1800s, but above this time, Town, there's something magical going on, you know, and 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 so I can, I can see that you know happening from time to time, you know, where you know there's that disconnect, and maybe a whole bunch of people missed it, but here's Vincent who's really appreciating the sky, and he's just going to paint that real quick, and of course you know then we go into you know can we see wind and you know where's the movement coming from as we teach this, but. Yeah, but I think you had such a great thing of like this town, maybe they missed something, but Vincent saw it. I feel like that is such like the the perfect ending to summarize. He saw something that everyone else was missing. I mean, that's kind of the brilliance and the tragedy of Vincent Van Gogh right there. It, it truly is. And I know, you know, I can't harp it on enough, but I know as adults, I'm sure you do this too, where you go on walks and the sun is setting and the sky is casted perfectly. Like one in about 30 skies a year. Yeah. You just look into the homes and the 90 inch TVs are going on and, and, and people are just missing it. What I'm hearing is you just look in people's windows. Pretty much. You're, you're a yeah. creeper. Yeah, pretty much, pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> and, and and I always think like, you know, society, like we're dealt with this, with a similar hand. Like he was locked behind bars, you yeah. know, f- kind of forced to look at life. Well, you keep looking in people's time. windows. You're going to be right there with them. <laughs> oh, my God. Yes. Oh. oh, my God. And you can't miss it. You know how you, you pass by and you're like, um, so they're watching baseball tonight. I mean, it's. Because it's in, as big as their window. But but you're right. There is something about like the sky at, at those times when like the light hits it just right. The sun like and it just reflects off the clouds in just that way. And how many people are missing that? And I'm wrapping it up. I want just a three point rating scale. And where should this hang? The loo? Is this something to look at? The lab? The lab. Is this something to learn from? Or the loop. British for the bastard. Yeah, there's a the loop joke in there somewhere. Oh, that's terrible.
all the Louvre. It, it, it has to stay in a Louvre. Yeah, I no argument here. I mean, just on every level, whether you look at it as a psychological piece, whether you look at it in that formalist lens, I mean, the movement of the sloped horizon leading into the the cypress tree that pulls the eye up and and leads so perfectly into the the spiraling, swirling sky that leads us back like just compositionally there's so many brilliant things that he's doing the the mirroring of the lights in the window and the stars in the sky and the the sort of contrasting colors all of it is just so beautifully executed and so it, perfectly arranged absolutely it, museum it, piece. It, it, yeah and you wonder like as as we are looking at it formally you wonder how much of the formal qualities he kept in mind like he considered right um i'm sure he considered many of the things you just mentioned but in a way he felt that he failed and yet a two by three foot painting we can sit here and look at for days because it just has you stuck inside the middle of it because of its movement yeah super striking so awesome absolutely um, well, thank you very much for taking so much time to talk about Vincent van Gogh, the ups and the downs and the brilliant work it produced. Thanks a lot. Oh, it's absolutely my pleasure. Um, I'll expect after the edits, this to be about a 10 minute podcast. <laughs> After I, after we take out all of my ums, it gets down to like 30 <laughs> seconds. This concludes this week's episode of Who Arted? If you found this tolerable, please like and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening. You can find images of the work being discussed this week and every week in the show notes on Twitter at WoodArtEd and on the website whoartedpodcast.com. Podcast done.